Well, the news was kind of interesting that came out yesterday, and that's that Disney and Tesla are going into business together, in a way. It's kind of a fascinating thing, and as a current Tesla owner and a former Disney cast member and somebody who really takes to heart everything Disney does, and I'm still a Disney fan and I do my Disney podcast and I have a whole bunch of other things that go on in the Disney space, I find it kind of interesting to uh, relay a story about this relationship between Disney and Tesla. Well, the story goes like this, that um, Tesla had approached Disney, uh, Elon Musk had talked to the Disney company about the potential to sponsor the uh, Tomorrowland Speedway and uh, to make some renovations there. Now, as you may know, if you know the history of the Tomorrowland Speedway, it all started back in the uh, 1950s when Bob Gurr developed these small cars that could go around on a track. And they're basically go-karts. They're cars that are uh, powered by a two-stroke engine, a, it's a, a lawnmower engine essentially, that goes around a track and they're able to, to go uh, very efficiently. Um, it's just a very simple engine, so they don't take much maintenance. The tires are the thing that take more maintenance than anything. And they sit on the track and they go around and uh, they just go around the, the, the circle on the track and it goes back and forth and curls around a little bit, but that's the way it works. And it's a very simple thing. They get probably, I would guess, somewhere around 100 miles to the gallon just based on their, uh, their size and what they're pulling and whatever. Don't know exactly, but they're all gas powered and very <clears throat> nice design for the 1950s into the 70s and maybe even to the 80s. But then sometime around the 80s, it became like, well, why are they still running these gas powered, essentially lawnmowers that are running around the track? And then as you move into the 90s, you still ask that question. And then as you get to the 2000s with new technologies evolving, you kind of have to ask, why are they still using the same technology? And, you know, I always, I always wondered about that. I remember being a cast member. I worked in the Emporium in the Magic Kingdom, but in the main changing room, in the dressing room they have, <clears throat> my locker was right next door to a guy who worked on the Tomorrowland Speedway. And whenever he was there, it smelled like gasoline. There was no doubt about it that he worked on the Speedway. It smelled like gasoline. Even when he wasn't there, there was this faint hint of, a whiff of, gasoline that was always in the air right from that locker that was next to me, you know, because he'd be covered in, you know, the fumes all day and then go take off his costume and, uh, you know, as he would, as he would change and whatever, and his shoes he would put in the locker, it would smell like gasoline. And it was just kind of weird. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, wow, that can't be environmentally friendly, number one. But number two, why is Disney still doing this? And I was there 25 years ago and I wondered that. And I always wondered why Disney never made any improvements to the Tomorrowland Speedway to like upgrade it or make changes to it, maybe make it a Cars theme something or something. I always kind of wondered about that. But when you think about it, at the end of the day, what it all comes down to is money. Disney didn't want to invest a lot of money into an attraction when they could get someone else to fund it for them. Over at Autopia, they currently have Honda as a sponsor. And uh, I guess, you know, that relationship allows them to continue to maintain Aut Autopia. But right now, uh, I don't believe there's a sponsor for uh, the uh, Tomorrowland Speedway at Disney World. There could be. I think Goodyear was a sponsor for a while, but I don't think they currently are. But anyway, the point is that, you know, they were looking for some capital infusion. Not that they can't afford to do it themselves. Clearly, they're doing a lot of construction and other things around the parks. But that was something that wasn't a priority for them because they ran well. And there was no reason to reconsider them or do make any changes to them. So along comes uh, Elon Musk and he makes the suggestion that he could, uh, they could actually make the cars environmentally friendly and get kids driving Teslas and actually have electric cars that go around the track. I give it two thumbs up for the concept. Of course, Disney's on board because they have someone else who's going to make renovations to the Speedway and they don't have to spend any money on it and it'll move into the 21st century. From the Tesla standpoint, while it's nice that they're going to help do some environmentally friendly things and you know going to do all these things that are going to happen, it's not about that. This is a proving ground for Tesla. Here they're going to take some of the batteries that they make, put them into small scale vehicles, and run them uh, on the order of you know between 12 and 15 hours a day, every day. So they will get more mileage out of those batteries than they would get out of a car over the course of a couple of years. So they will they will test the heck out of these batteries and be able to figure out how, when to replace them, how what their charge looks like, how well they're, they're working, how efficient they are, when their charge starts getting lost, and all of these things about the batteries. They'll also, also learn more about how to replace the batteries, when to replace the batteries, uh, you know, some of these things about how quickly they can replace them. Can they train someone to easily push a, pull a battery out, battery pack out and put a new battery pack into the car and do it in a short amount of time because that will help them in the long term in terms of the overall goal for Tesla of creating essentially service stations that 
well, I guess I should back up a second. So Tesla always had this model in mind of being able to charge your car in about the same time as it takes to get gas. So you would pull into a, a supercharger and you would start uh, putting uh, the, the charge on it. And when it first started, it was about 45 minutes to an hour to charge up your car. Now it's down to about 35 to 45 minutes to charge your car. They're trying to in, in, decrease that time and increase the capacity and the throughput, but it's hard because you reach a physical barrier where there's really nothing else you can do with the technologies that exist today to increase that time or increase that efficiency and decrease the time. Um, but they had a thought that maybe they could create these stations that you would pull into and they would basically drop your battery pack out and put a new battery pack in and you could be there for less than 10 minutes. Uh, if you just pull through, they would just change them out that quickly. Now, whether that's feasible or not is anyone's guess, but now at least they can test the, the hypothesis out and see if it's even possible to do it. And how efficient is it? How well does it work? Yes, it's a small scale test because these are small cars and they use a limited number of batteries, but Tesla gets some advantages from doing this. Now look, I'm a Tesla owner, and the one thing that I've learned about being a Tesla owner is that you give up some of your privacy because you're, there's always data points being collected around, along the way about everything, about your battery, about your charging, about how you use the car. All of these things are being collected. Now it's not about me specifically, it's about the aggregate of all this information that's being drawn together and put out there as part of a, a general collective for how to make these cars better. And I'm happy to do that because I think that's for the sort of a greater good kind of thing. So I'll give up some things in order to get some things in return. I love driving this car, this electric car. It's really fun to drive. So as I look at that, I realize that they're going to get you know, figure out how to do some efficiencies in terms of using their batteries. Plus, they'll actually figure out the life scale of these batteries and some other things. And not only that, between them and the Disney Imagineers, they can come up with some clever and creative ideas for how to charge it. I can't imagine that they're thinking about like putting essentially superchargers on the side and pulling the cars off the track and plugging them in for you know 20 minutes at a time. That may be an option, but I have to imagine they're thinking bigger than that. Inductive charging is what comes to mind. Could you put some sort of inductive charging along the rail? If you think about the uh, where you come in, if you think about the, the uh, Disney World version, there's the stoplight and there's always the traffic that backs up at the stoplight all the way up to where you load and unload. So you've got maybe a couple of minutes in there where if you were inductive charging, and that's basically putting some sort of uh, charger material under the ground, you could put it under the concrete, you could actually get people, uh, get these cars charged back up enough to continue running around the track at least one or two more times for every charge that you put on it. So you fully charge them in the morning, put them on the track and let them go, and then you charge them overnight, or you take them off the track at various times to, for maintenance and whatever, and you recharge them at that point. But I think you could do some things, and I have to imagine that's in the plan, and that was part of the plan here, was to think about how could they make it better and more efficient. Because if you can find a way to inductive charge without having to plug the charger into the car, you've solved a different problem, right? You've, you've recreated, you've created something new, some sort of new technology that didn't exist. I mean, the technology is there, but you're creating it for the mass market. Because for the first time, you could theoretically charge cars on the go. Mm. So I started thinking about that and it was like, wow, it's a really cool idea. Now, whether they go through with it or not, I really don't know. I have no inside information. It was just my thought as I started to consider the whole prospect of what they were trying to do. It, it, it occurred to me that this might be something they want to do. And I certainly hope that they pursue it in some way and look into it. Look, the changeover from the gas cars they have today to the electric cars could effectively happen overnight. You could take all the cars, you're going to have to build new cars with the electric components to them and you'll put them on the track and you would use the same track essentially and you would use the same guide system and whatever, but now you would have the electric cars running on the track. If you think about the cars that run on the Tomorrowland Speedway today, it's essentially like an electric car. You put your foot on the gas and it goes, you take your foot off and it breaks. That's what an electric car does. It works exactly the same way. You do have brakes in the car just in case of an emergency, but you don't have to use them. You can use just the uh, the gas pedal to move your car and then use the regenerative braking to actually stop the car because it's actually using the motor to stop the car. So it's very cool and it would work almost exactly the same from the consumer perspective. You get in the car at the speedway, it would feel kind of the same because that's the way the cars work. But now you would have the experience of driving an electric car. And believe me, these cars really do have some serious pickup. It's something that happens uh, that you push the you push the pedal and this car goes. Uh, you know, it really does move. So I can see how they could potentially make it feel like you're driving a race car um, in that sense and still keep the speed limit low. 
and make the cars actually move very quickly around the track. So I'm thinking about it and I'm like, this is really intriguing. I like the concept of what they're trying to do here. So you could effectively put the cars on the track um, overnight. You could move new cars on there and the next day be up and running. And then over the course of the next several months, you could shut down part of the track. So in the uh, Disney World version, you have two lines that you come to. And on you know the right side, there's a right and a left that goes with it. And on the left side, there's a right and a left that goes with it. So you actually have four tracks that start off that meet up on, uh, on, the, tr on the actual um, racetrack. So you have four starting points. So you could actually shut down one of the lines and two, do two of the starting points at the same time and do whatever you wanted to do to it. If you wanted to bury some inductive charging uh, cables or some uh, electromagnetic plates or whatever they're going to do there, you could certainly do that while the ride is still running. You would just reduce capacity for some period of time while you're doing it but you could leave the attraction open effectively, which is kind of a cool thing. That doesn't happen often at Disney where you have the ability to change over something that simply, to move over, to put new cars on the track and then to actually add um, functionality if you want to, to be able to do something with it. Now, of course, they'll have to uptrain all the cast members on how to use the cars, because today they have to train them on how to restart the cars, push them off the track, that sort of thing. The braking system they have with the gas pedal on the side, all of that can be overcome in much the same way it is today. It's just replacing the engine with a battery pack and a motor. I mean, that's essentially it. And then you would just have to train them on how to charge them and keep them going, because today they charge them on, they train them on how to uh, put gas in them and do some things with them. So, potentially, really interesting and I was just fascinated by that and I love this story. These are the stories that innovate, of innovation that really fascinate me and interest me because somebody's taking a leap of faith and a leap of technology to do something. Look, that's what it's all about and I'm glad to see that um, Disney is, is willing to take this on as another proving ground. Disney's done a lot of these things in the very recent times. They've always done it to a degree but in very recent times they've been doing a lot more of it and getting more engaged with different companies and figuring out how to make things much more effective and using technology that's very different from the uh, new ticketing system that they use with the fingerprint and the uh, and the, and the, uh, the card and the magic band and all of that stuff where you go into the gate and you don't have a turnstile anymore that technology uses a lot of um, Apple components to it and there's a, I'm sure there are a lot of patents on both sides I think Disney owns the wearable technology Apple owns some of the reader technology so between the two they get it working and they're proving efficiency that can help something else down the line. It's not about entering a theme park. While it is, that's not the end goal. It's the same thing with this sort of technology about using battery-operated cars on the Tomorrowland Speedway. It's not about the cars and it's not about the Speedway. It's about the technology and what we have available to us. So just a really interesting thing and I wanted to share that with you. It was just kind of fascinating. Um, I hope you like the stories like this that I tell once in a while. Um, you know, this is a video that I think uh, kind of crosses over between my Disney related channel and my Tesla related channel. So I hope you enjoy it in both.